Okay, good morning, good afternoon. So, today we are going to complete our discussion about theories, principles, and guidelines, and we will focus on the guidelines uniquely because we just covered the other two parts. And guidelines together with principle are things that you can already use as a way to generate some pros and cons for your paper prototype, for your two paper prototypes. So you can also refer to the principle and also to the guidelines that we are going to see to some of these guidelines, maybe, uh, for having a list of pros and cons, if you want, hmm? in addition to any other modality that you can consider and that there are reported in the assignment tree um, text. Hmm? So we moved from theories to principle to guideline. Theories are clearly, just as a recap, the most general and high level. Then we move to principle that are some way more specific, yet applicable to many different domain and many different applications. Guidelines instead tell how, how we're going to satisfy some principle in some specific domain. So these are concrete suggestions written in different way according to guideline to guideline about how the principle may be satisfied, and in some cases also when it makes sense to do something. So we, we have seen, for instance, the uh, principle about consistency, and we said that consistency is overall good, but in some cases we also have seen that inconsistency can help. So while the principle is strive for consistency, we already have discussed in the lecture that inconsistency can also be good. But the principle doesn't say how or when to apply one or the other. It just say, if possible, be consistent, overall in general. So the guidelines try to instead specify better these details. They are often rule-based, not always. We will see a few examples in practice. They are based on best practice. They're not just theories. They are validated guidelines. And, and so being uh, validated, they are based on the experience of actual people working in that specific domain or more than one people. And in some cases, they are treated or they are standards. Hmm? And so they maybe are also linked and used in laws. Hmm? Um, However, guidelines are specific, very, very specific for a domain. And in some cases, you can have guidelines that even if you are in the right domain, they don't apply for you. Because in your project, in your idea, in your situation, that guidance simply doesn't apply. It's not wrong or bad or good, it just doesn't apply at all. So these are the low level. And we are going to see a few examples of these guidelines. So we can have guidelines that are related to, uh, for instance, the web. Hmm? So this is even also a book, but it's guidelines that say how you should structure the style of a web application. It doesn't apply to mobile application. It doesn't apply to virtual reality application. It doesn't apply to desktop application. It's just for the web. Hmm? So if you are doing something Web-based, this is something you can consider to use. If you are doing something, say, a mobile application, this is totally useless as a guideline. Hmm? Then clearly guidelines reflect principles. So you can still apply the principle and consider that. But a specific set of rules, these are related to the web and not to others. Similarly, there are guidelines for accessibility of content on the web. So not accessibility overall, not accessibility of a browser, of a software application for the web, 
but for the content that is put on a web page. And these are also standard guidelines. For instance, European law about accessibility, including the Italian law about accessibility, refer explicitly to this. So if you read, because you are in a very boring day, if you read the Italian law about accessibility, that is called the Legge Stanca, is actually the current version, the new version, refer explicitly to these WCAG guidelines. You just say, follow that guidelines. And these are international guidelines. So we are going to, to see how these guidelines are written, just to make a more concrete example. So for instance, we can Uh, go directly in the standard, maybe not. Uh, let me okay. mm -hmm. so here there is this uh, modality that allow you to uh, explore the guidelines and also have more details without reading the actual standard. Mm -hmm. So just to make an example, since the web is something you are familiar with. So one guideline as a title is typically structured in can be structured in different sections, but typical guidelines are the title and hmm, descriptions. Hmm? So in this case, the guidelines say text alternative. And the text is provide text alternative for any non-text content so that it can be changed into other form people need, such as large print, braille, speech, simple, or simple language. So if you go deep on this, it will tell you, for instance, that um, you should use, to meet this guideline on the web, for content on the web, you should use a text alternative on one item within a group of images that describe all the items in the groups, or that you sh must use to meet this guideline the text alternative on image. And this is specific for the web, because for the web, we have for images the attributes that is alt, that is proper to the images, that allow you to define alternative text to the images. Hmm? So these are, these are telling you how to meet Something, in this case, is sufficient, or this is also split in different level of success. Mm? So you can be compliant at different levels, not a lot of compliant, good compliant, or incredibly compliant. And these are levels. Mm? And this is an example of guidelines. So all non-text con non content is presented to the user, must have a text alternative. So it's not saying exactly if you don't expand the guideline how. If you expand the technique, you, you also say that, you can also see that you have to use the alt text for images, for instance. But it tells you that you have to provide not text of content for all the not text, the text of content for all the non-textual elements on a web page. Hmm? And et cetera. Hmm? So for instance, if you go on the um, another category, just to make another example, contrast. 1.3 here. This is even more specific. The visual representation of text in images of text has a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 on 1. So specific number, you can check the contrast between the background and the foreground and see if the color of the contrast is meet this specification. So here we are not strive for consistency, whatever it means. We are the color of the background and the color of the foreground that is used in that moment should have at minimum this contrast. So this contrast is not met by gray on black. This is not met by light gray on white, because they are too similar. Th it is absolutely met by 
black text on black text on white background that has even more higher contrast already. So, etc. and so on. So these are a list of things that you can, in most cases, put into some rules and apply them automatically. In other cases, you have to check manually if they are satisfied for evaluation or for designing. If you are creating a web page, you know that you have to keep that contract, so you will use color adequately. Indeed, some of these guidelines, for instance, Chrome has uh, an extension mm, to check the accessibility of a page according to this guideline. And it's automatic for most of these guidelines. Then there are other guidelines that need human intervention. But colors, size of the text, the presence of alternative text for any non-textual content is something that you can automatically check and verify. So these are guidelines, see, much more specific than the principle that we have seen and applicable on the web for the content. Then some of them can be reasonable and you can also consider them for other uh, medium. So providing a text alternative for a non-textual content could also apply on mobile, but then you cannot have the same example and the same mechanism to do that than you have on the web, because it's a different language, it's a different way of working. So this is an example of a guideline. Then we have, we can have guidelines that are more specific, not just on the web, not just about accessibility on the web, but it could be national, for instance. So the US government has a series of guidelines for mobile user experience. So if you do a mobile application for the US government, you should follow these guidelines. And similarly, the UK government has a series of guidelines and actually an entire design system, so also with patterns, start of the button, layout of the page, etc., for all the UK.gov.uk website. So if you are part of the government of UK and you want to create a website here, there are guidelines and elements to be used for that. And similarly, also the Italian government has such guidelines for the public administration website, with example for municipalities, region, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these are guidelines that tell the designer, the developer, how to do things for specific sectors. Again, not the web in general, not accessibility, on the web in general, but specific domain. On the web, for instance, in this case, or in the case of UK government, or on mobile for the US government. So these are guidelines that again, apply very well if you are going to do something for this specific domain. You can read that and get inspiration or analyze if they are reasonable or not, but still they apply specifically for something. So these are instead location-based, country-based, instead of being general like the accessibility guidelines. And if you develop something for the major three operating systems, either desktop or mobile, you have guidelines. Guidelines by Apple for iOS and macOS, etc., that tell you which are the guidelines, the best practice, if you want to develop an application for the Apple ecosystem, you have to follow this to keep consistency among applications, to keep uh, the same knowledge, to meet the, the, the mental model of the user that is already used to that specific environment. So all the application follows some rules. And so that is familiarity in the person that use that, um, that software, that family of application. So Apple has the human interface guidelines that apply to Apple products. And similarly, Microsoft has guidelines. For instance, the Fluent the system that tell how Microsoft application and now Microsoft tools should work, should appear. So if you are not interested in doing anything for Microsoft systems, not working at Microsoft, but just for Microsoft system, you can ignore this and use the Apple guidelines. 
if you are instead interested on, 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 on the Apple ecosystem. And similarly, Google has their own guideline for designing system, for design application, for design user interface, for their own system, either Android or Chrome OS. And these guidelines, again, are way more specific than principle, and they are really bounded to the specific platform. Mm -hmm. So if you use Android, you will, you will be able to, you should be able to recognize in any application that you have that these guidelines, some of them at least, are respected and respected well. Mm -hmm. And similarly for Microsoft and for Apple. Mm -hmm. And if you create something, this is, uh, for this operating system, for instance, is something, uh, even the guidelines, something that help you to make the size decision and help you to have your application more used because again, it's more similar to all the other application. People doesn't have to learn how to do something or where is a menu or where is the navigation, if it's on top on the bottom because it's used to in that operating system, in that ecosystem. So all these companies provide the guidelines. And we can also have guidelines not specific for web technology in general, so traditional content, uh, traditional technology like the web, or for operating systems, but we can, can, for instance, can have guidelines for human interaction. Hmm? So if you are in the third lot of the lab, this is something that you can use right now. And these are actually guidelines created by Microsoft for Research. Microsoft is split into, let's say, companies. One is Microsoft Corporate that does the product. Uh, too big, let's say, then there are other divisions, but, and the other one is Microsoft Research that doesn't have anything to do with products, it just do research. Mm -hmm. So they are researchers. They work in collaboration with universities. So they created these guidelines about human interaction and it's not important here if it's a Microsoft product, if an Apple product, it is about Spotify or Netflix. These are not technology bound, but these are related to the specific um, way of interacting between humans and AI in general. And Microsoft also did this guidance very, very well, actually, and they were not only, they are not only did the guidelines, but they also did some example for each guideline hmm, to make them more concrete. Example of good practice and bad practice. And they released this as card. Hmm, if, you, if you met some, if you go in some places where there is a stand or booth of Microsoft, you can also find these, I, I have those on, on card, like actual cards, uh, where on the front they tell you which are the guidelines and the back the example, the positive example, and they, on the website, they have more example, positive or not. And they build a toolkit out of this, so even much more than just the guideline. But you see, here we can see another example of the guidelines. So make clear how well the system can do what it can do. And this is the title. And the, the smaller descriptions say, help the user understand how often the AI system may make mistakes. Hmm? Because AI systems are typically based on statistical reasoning, so it can make mistakes in some, it will make mistakes in some occasion. Hmm? So the guidelines say, help the user understand how often the AI system may make mistake. So make clear how well the system can do hmm, what they do. And here there is an example in practice about, in this case, Apple Music. Um, that is a small thing, but they say, uh, discover new music. It's about the recommendation system of music. Let's say discover new music from the artist we think you would like. So small thing, but the language in this case was appropriate because it doesn't say here there are the music that for sure you will like. 
trust me. But say, here are some music that we think we could like. So it set the right expectation on the people that is reading that. It's not an absolute truth, it's just we think you could like this. If you don't, nothing happened. Just ignore the list. And another guidelines, so this is something, so they split the guidelines in actually four moments. What you should consider initially, what you should consider during the interaction with any AI system, uh, what you should do when the AI system is wrong, and what instead you should consider over time, over the lifetime of any AI system. And so this was initially, to make clear initially what, what are the expectations hmm, of what the system can do. And another example here is when things went wrong. Hmm, so when you do something wrong, support efficient correction. Hmm, make it easy to edit, refine, or recover when the AI system is wrong. And this is incredibly familiar and similar to the principles about the error recovery being always able to recover from errors. That was one principle that we have seen last week. So this is just an implementation, let's say a specification in a particular case uh, about uh, that principle. Let's say support efficient correction. So give the possibility to correct in an efficient way. And here there is an example from, from, being, search, from being search, but the same happens with Google search in which you, you, you type something and the, the search engine say including results for another term that is similar to the one you have uh, used but it's not identical. And then it also gives you a possibility to say do you want to see only results for that modified word or not? And you can ignore it. You can follow with your own research because maybe your you type something correctly, or you can say, no, I just want to see something because it was maybe a typo uh, in the things that they brought. So these are the Microsoft guidelines for human AI interaction, and they also have uh, a website in which the list, the guidelines that are exactly the one that um, I show you, but also, like the guidelines for accessibility, they go a little bit uh, farther and explain which is the problem that, that the guideline met, explain which is the solution, explain when to use that, and explain how to do that as a concrete example. So just not be more efficient in providing correction, but also explaining when this can happen, when this makes sense to apply these and how you can amend these and apply successfully this guideline. And which are also the common problem, the common issue that you may have. So it's, it's very, very specific, it's, very, very pre it's incredibly precise what you can do with these, um, with these guidelines. So that, again, it's something for a designer, for a developer, ready to be used. You can pick a system, you can pick the guidelines and say, okay, I have this, this apply to me? Yes, no. If this apply, I met that guideline or I don't met the guideline. And if I met the guideline, good. If I don't met the guideline, how can I change the user interface to met the guideline? And we need specifically guideline for human AI interaction because it's a different kind of interaction with non-AI system. Because the AI system have characteristic, a specific characteristic that is the unpredictable results. Given an output, we can have different, given an input, we can have a different set of output according to the user, according to the time, according to what happens before. That this is something that doesn't happen with traditional computer system. If you click a button, you get a response, always the same. Either an error or not. With AI, you don't know. You cannot know now what is the output of that. So this unpredictability needs specific guideline to cover that. And again, some of them, like support efficient correction, is very, very close to principle. But in this case, it's declined and specified well for 
especially on the website, for the AI interaction. And similarly, just to make another example, just not to monopolize everything about AI, uh, there also exist guidelines for augmented reality, for virtual reality. So not only guidelines about normal technology or about um, operating system, but also guidelines that can apply across technology for more innovative and uh, things. Uh, for instance, this is by Apple Design, just one example. Um, and they are written in a way less uh, specific way than the Microsoft one. This is actually Apple as product, not Apple as research. Instead, the others came out from, from research perspective. But still, they are quite specific. Just to give you another template for guidelines. So when you're doing a augmented reality application, then in some cases also speaks about specific technology because it's, we are on the Apple website, so they are referring to their own technology, but the guidelines is still applicable in general if you just ignore the specific detail. But for instance, one guidance say people should use the entire display in AR. So if, you're not, if your application is not using entire display, think about it. You are going against these guidelines. And guidelines, again, are typically built upon experience, not just one person that wake up in the morning and say, let's write this. And they also have some details. Uh, or strive, strive for convincing illusion when placing realistic object. And here there is a detail that also speaks about uh, make sure your app updates seen 60 times per second so it also gives very, very precise, similar to what happens for the accessibility guideline on what to do. How many times my application should update the scene? At least 60 times per second. So very, very specific also information here. And this is gone, clearly. Minimize text. So if you're doing augmented reality, try not to use too much text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With also examples in the Apple ecosystem, clearly, and so on. Hmm? Then similar guidelines are also available in, let's say, for instance, for human eye interaction, there are these very well done, very, very um, detailed guidelines from Microsoft, but uh, Google, for instance, has a similar uh, set of guidelines. That's called the guidebook. instead of guidelines, and it's uh, the people plus AI guidebook that's called the PAIR, P, P stands for people, A, A stands for AI, R stands for research, so not like the title, and you can also have guide, guidelines, questions, and examples, and they are also, this is, since this is a guidebook, not, ju not just guidelines, for instance, they start from user needs, need finding, how need finding can be adapted for AI technology, hmm? which are the best practice you can use for in this case. And they also do example with a fictionary uh, application that's called RAN, hmm? showing example of guidelines and pra best practices uh, using this, this application as, as example. So showing you the right screenshot of the application that follow a guidelines or best practice and the wrong example in the, let's say, uh, Android ecosystem. Uh, let me see if there is another guideline here, another screenshot here. And in any way, anyway, so these are others set of, they also think, speak about data sets, so way, way more specific. So for instance, these are other two examples in which they say that the first one is the best one, aim for this and explain why, and the other one say avoid this hmm, as a way to uh, exemplify a given guideline. In this case, um, revealing user data. So these are, it's more a book than not guidelines, but still they have indication on what to do when you create um, 
application that involves AI, and specifically here, machine learning. In this case, very, very specific to machine learning and, and data. In the Microsoft case, they are a little bit more generic, not just focusing on, not 100% focusing on data, database AI, let's say. So, and similarly for augmented reality, you can find guidelines for Google, guidelines from Meta, so the Oculus, guidelines for, from other people. For their own developer, mostly, so this, they rely on specific technology, but again, if instead of speaking about AR kit, we are speaking about whatever is called in the Google ecosystem or in Unity, it's, it's the same. The guidelines can apply in any case, except for the more technical part. Because again, these are more about a specific topic, human AI interaction, augmented reality, the web, like the, the first that we have mentioned, and not by a specific technology, a specific producer, like Apple, Google, Microsoft, and their guidelines for um, the human interface guidelines for their application and products. So this close the guidelines part. Um, we are not going to start now speaking about visual design. We, we are going to speak about visual design tomorrow. Uh, what we are going to do now is an exercise, or you are going to do an exercise, mostly. Uh, let's try to apply 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like this, some of these guidelines. And if you want some principle, since this could be one thing that you can do also for your project, it can make sense. And in particular, since everybody of you has a smartphone here, right? Do you have a smartphone here? Yes? Thank you for showing me the smartphone. Um, so we are trying to, so you are trying to apply these guidelines. Here, not to the smartphone in general, but to the vocal assistant that is available on your smartphone. So if you have an Android smartphone, you will probably have a Google. If you have an iPhone, you will probably have Siri and something like that. So try to use that app or feature and try to check against these guidelines a Google or Siri or whatever you can have on your, or Samsung Bixby, if it's still a thing, uh, you can use, if they met these guidelines or not, and if some of these guidelines apply or not. Hmm? So the first thing is to open this uh, conversational agent. If you don't have experience with them, maybe ask a few questions, what's the waiter, maybe correct question, wrong questions, etc. then pick the guidelines, here there is a link, that is a really bad link actually. Um, so this link is, is, you are going to do it by groups alone and then you will, you will speak. Um, so this is a better link um, that is HAX toolkit. Uh, Microsoft.com and US HAX toolkit slash AI guidelines. And if you know how this application works, you don't have to, to call them clearly. But if you don't and you, you want to experiment now, you can. And being in a room with a lot of people that will try will also allow you to see what happens when other people around will use, will speak with the same system and you can see how well your smartphone will react to you or to them because they are close to you. So let's say 15 minutes, pick the guidelines, try to apply some of them one at a time and then we can uh, discuss a little bit and then we close the, the lecture for today.
Okay, so let's check the some guidelines so far. So let's start from the one that say initially. Hmm? Initially means when you open, when you first see the AI powered system. Hmm? So initially you didn't interact yet. You have two guidelines to consider. Again, this guideline can be used as you did for evaluating an existing system, but also if you design a system, you can say, okay, is my system making clear what I can do when people open it or not? And if the answer is no, at design time or development time, you can still amend it. So make clear what the system can do. So initially, does how many of you, so which, let's say, how many use used Google Assistant for this exercise? Two people? Three, four, okay. And how many of you use Siri? Okay, so Google Assistant. Uh, any other ass vocal assistant used? You use Alexa? You tried Bixby. Okay, so Google Assistant. When you first interact with Google Assistant, when you open Google Assistant, you start Google Assistant, is making clear what Google Assistant can do to you? You can, you know how to use it? Okay, so it tells you how you can use it. Vocally, pushing a microphone, yes, good. And these guidelines could also be applied in another sense. So which are the features which are the questions you can ask to Google Assistant? Is tell you which are all the questions you can ask? Yes, it has a sort of help that can use a sort of help. So for how the system do that is checked. Is first of all, this apply to Google Assistant? Yes, as a guideline. Uh, since it apply, it it's satisfied, let's say, for the how, clearly, because there is an icon, you can understand how, and for what does it does, mm, sort of, you have to ask, you have to, to, to know that you can ask, and so not, not a lot, but that is a problem with all the virtual assistant, not just Google Assistant, so that is the problem of the conversational assistant, not, not knowing, uh, they don't have affordances, that we have in the visual graphical applications, so they don't know, we don't know how, what we can ask them. Hmm? We know by experience, we need to remember. Uh, Siri, uh, same things or different? Same. Make clear how well the system can do what it can do. Hmm? So help the user understand how often Google Assistant slash Siri slash slash Alexa, uh, may make mistakes initially without using it. Is it clear how precise it will be? No. Same for everybody, every assistant? Okay. So this can apply, but is not satisfied. Hmm? And so if you are going to redesign or design another vocal assistant, you can for instance, imagine hmm, to have some clue hmm, about what works and what not. In conversational agent is particularly complicated because especially the vocal one, because they're expected to speak with them. So you can also use it without looking at the screen most of the time. So it's difficult to have this kind of, uh, again, affordances for that. So during interaction, so now you start using it. Uh, the guidelines say time services based on context. So time when to act or to interrupt based on the user current task and environment. Does this apply to, to Google Assistant slash Siri slash Alexa slash Bixby or not? So the request is, I can't specify this. 
If the system is proactive, is telling you something without you doing anything, then these time services, so notification, something like this, should be appropriate for the context. So our Google Assistant, et cetera, send sort of notification or you have to start a conversation only? Both. 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 When? Okay, so Google Assistant, let's say no, you, this doesn't apply for Google Assistant, probably doesn't apply with Siri, with Alexa can apply. So uh, how, how well it work? So since it apply, is it satisfied this guideline with Alexa or not? But when it give you um, this message, whatever, can you make an example of this message uh, that? Uh, okay, you see, you, you receive a vocal notification that your pack is arrived or it's in delivery, okay. Um, is those, are those messages sent in the right moment to you when you are interested in listening them? Okay, so if it is, in that example, is satisfied, seems satisfied, at least on your yeah. knowledge, let's say on your experience, and then you should do, you can do the same, the same uh, thing with all the others, if there are others proactive behavior, not just about deliveries, but also about other things, hmm? uh, if they are, if they exist for, for Alexa, etc. Okay, one more. Um, Uh, match relevant social norms. So ensure that the experience is delivered in a way that the user would expect given their social and cultural context. Does this apply to Google Assistant, Siri, and Alexa? This is not this one. This is relevant social norms, not contextual norms. So the waiter is not a social norm, right? Um, so ensure that things, so the waiter, if we want to follow the example of the waiter, is delivered in a way so the better forecast is presented, vocally or not, in a way that people would expect given their social and cultural context in terms of languages, in terms of pictures, in terms of representations, in terms of things. It's not about how um, appropriate is the weather forecasting or how precise is the weather forecasting, just to use this as an example, but in the way it is presented to you. So this apply, this should apply because these conversational assistants should speak matching relevant social norms. So, do they? It's polite, yeah. let's say, it's polite. Okay, so I would say that sort of respect this guideline because yes, it's polite, it is a good starting point, uh, but it makes difference between a child or an adult or an elderly in the way it presents information. No, it's general purpose. It speaks exactly the same way to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are rude with this assistant, they will reply 
always in the same way, probably in a polite way. So, and if you are polite, they will reply with polite. If you don't understand, you can ask. And they can, up to a certain level, explain. But again, this explanation is not related to the, the level, the social norms you are inserted in, so the context in which you are inserted in. So these are more, uh, let's say, less, uh, more, more precise. So here there is an example about uh, the editor in some Microsoft application uh, that say that identifying the text way to improve the writing style. And so, but instead of say, you write a wrong sentence in English, fix it. It say consider. So it's more polite. Consider using blah blah. blah. So this, for sure, being polite is a good starting point. So we would say that is one level, the, the, for probably the easy level for matching social norm, but we should understand if they are matching all the social norms hmm? and everywhere. So we don't know probably, but we don't know. I, I don't know, but if you use Google Assistant here in Italy or in South Africa or in Pakistan, it will work the same way and will respect the same social norms or they will respect the Western social norms? I don't have an answer, but it's something that one should consider if it's doing a product that is worldwide. It's not just um, focused on one single country. Hmm? Okay, but sort of these are how you apply guidelines and for evaluation for designing things. So before closing this lecture, we are closing a little bit earlier today. Uh, I want to dedicate the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes if you have any questions about the assignment. And if you don't, now the door is open. Before it wasn't, so you can you can continue with your day. But if you want, I can stay here for 15, 20 minutes for whatever question about assignment three that is due in three days, and it will be discussed on Friday. But before that, let me just tell you one thing that is not not really related to the course. That is this. So. Um, we are, so, how to start? Um, together with the University of Turin, we are organizing this conference that is called CAI Italy, even if in Italy you would say Key Italy, but it's sort of English, so CAI Italy, uh, 2023, 2023, that is the Biennial Conference of Human Computer Interaction, the Italian Biennial Conference of Human Computer Interaction, National Conference of Human Computer Interaction, that in September next year will be in Turin, and that's why uh, I am organizing this together with um, a professor of HCI at the University of Turin on the Computer Science Department, and this will be end of September, that should be the end of the 2022 September, should be the end of the exam session next year. And we are organizing it partially here at Politecnico and partially at the University of Turing. We are still, well, it's not tomorrow, so we are working on the details. But the, the message that they want to, to start to give you and the invitation that I want to give you or, or, or right now, basically, uh, are two, actually. Uh, first of all, we would like to do something, whatever is something, um, involving uh, students from the HCI courses of both universities. So meaning you here and whatever human interaction course that you at university, at the University of Turing. Uh, we don't know yet the details. For sure, it will be um, optional. Mm? By that date, you will probably have all successfully passed the exam. So not, 
anything related to the grades, etc. But we, we are thinking about ways to maybe connect students with industry, interested in human interaction, maybe showcasing your project to industry, something like that. Mm? So we are thinking about a way to involve the one of you that A, will be still here in Italy in September, and B, wants to, to do this. Um, so just to, to let you know that this is one possibility to showcase will possibly be a possibility to showcase your project, because that is the main artifact that you will have after this course. So the, the final version of the project, especially. And the second one is that we are going to, uh, so this is, is a, an academic conference. So there will be talk from people uh, all over, not only in Italy, but also in, we have typically some people from Europe coming here. Uh, we would like to have an online version in the metaverse, because it sounds cool, but it's online, but in 3D or some sort of virtual reality. We have, we have two people working on that, not here, but in the, in the program, among the people that organize the conference. And so this will be a conference. We talk uh, with a researcher, with some people from industry, mainly in Italy, from Italy, but not only. And the other things that we uh, would like to ask students, and especially HCI students in both university, uh, is a possibility again to, to be a student volunteer, so to help with the conference in those days, help people uh, say, okay, this is the room, is there there, and uh, meet with some researcher, meet with some industry people interested in the field, and joining the the conference, um, etc. So this is for free, clearly. It's volunteering, that means for you, you, you work for free because it's volunteer, but also you have access to the conference, to the coffee breaks, to the lunches, to the dinners, for free. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's part of the service that a person does to, to a conference. Um, so this is another thing that we would like to, to involve. We would like, first of all, involving students doing HCI. Uh, and then we will also open it to all students. The student volunteer part will also open it to all students uh, in Italy. So we can also have students from other universities helping with that. Optionally, voluntarily, it's not mandatory, it's not bind with the course, it's not related to anything about the course. It's just the same topic. Okay, and we have a website that is this one, that is skyitaly23.it.it. And that is almost empty, but it will be um, filled up. And in the organizing committee, you can see that, well, except me and Christina, that is the, we are the general chairs. We have a lot of other people from Cagliari, Bari, Bologna, Palermo, uh, some people from France, uh, Rome, etc., etc., etc. And also we have two people from the Metaverse and Hybrid Conference that are from Udine. Um, and so on. So here there are the people that are currently organizing the conference. Um, here, also managing the website, the social media, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all of this to say mm, that I will probably ask you a certain point if you, if the group is interested in doing this showcase uh, at this conference, but we are still defining the details, and instead if there are individuals interested in volunteer to help running this. This, is, this conference is not the first year we're doing that. This is a biannual conference that exists from several years, and two years ago it was in Bolzano, and this year it's going to be here. It was in Rome, it was all over Italy. So it's a national conference, but it will be in English. Everything will be in English, all the talk will be in English. People will speak Italian if they're all Italians, but the talk, the official program will be in English. And we are organizing this uh, in these days. So uh, Christina already told their students, her students, about these two things uh, last week. And so it was time for me also to, to do the same. And that's it. So if you have any questions, again, I will still be here for these 50 minutes. Otherwise, we will see, we will meet tomorrow.